Inflation fears are always lingering. Here we'll look at what inflation is, why it occurs, how it's measured, and the best assets to hedge against it with their corresponding ETFs. What is inflation? Simply put, inflation refers to an aggregate increase in prices, commonly measured by the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. Put another way, purchasing power decreases as inflation increases. This means that for any given unit of currency, in this case the US dollar, you're able to buy fewer goods and services as time goes on. Average annual inflation in the United States is about 2%. This is why it's usually advisable to not hold a significant allocation to uninvested cash, as it's likely simply losing to inflation. This is especially true recently, as inflation has been much higher, around 7%. Inflation is illustrated in the stories your parents tell of being able to go to the movies and get popcorn and a drink for 25 cents 40 to 50 years ago, whereas it's about 100 times that today. A central bank manages the money supply to attempt to keep inflation within a reasonable limit. This reasonable level of inflation is maintained because it encourages people to spend now, thereby promoting economic growth rather than saving, as a dollar today is worth more than the same dollar tomorrow on average. This somewhat constant level of inflation helps maintain price stability, think better planning for the future for both businesses and consumers, and is thought to maximize employment and economic well-being. Investors expect returns greater than this reasonable average level of inflation, and workers expect wage increases to keep pace with the increasing cost of living. Inflation is typically measured by two common statistics, the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, a measure of the price in aggregate of consumer goods and services, like food, apparel, education, etc., and the Wholesale Price Index, or WPI, a measure of the price of goods at the production level. Instead of the WPI, the United States uses a similar index called the Producer Price Index, or PPI. CPI is used to measure the cost of living. All these are tracked, maintained, and reported by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. They report the CPI monthly going back to 1913. You can even narrow down CPI by region within the U.S. When people reference the inflation rate, they're referring to the CPI. Why does inflation occur? Inflation can occur as any of the following. First, we have demand pull inflation. In short, demand exceeds supply, causing upward pressure on prices, also colloquially described as too many dollars chasing too few goods. Recall Keynesian economics and the supply versus demand curve from microeconomics. Demand pull inflation can be caused by things like a growing economy, an increase in the money supply, and an increase in government spending. Next, we have cost push inflation. Increases in wages and production Production costs, like raw materials, necessarily drive prices up, while demand for goods and services stays constant or increases. Next, we have built-in inflation. Built-in inflation simply describes the fact that people expect inflation to continually raise prices to keep pace. Because of this increase in prices, consumers demand higher wages to keep up with a rising cost of living, which in turn causes firms to raise prices, and the cycle continues. We can calculate the annual rate of inflation or the change in prices for any time period using CPI values with the following formula. The annual CPI was 255.7 for 2019 and 258.8 for 2020. We can calculate the annual inflation rate like this. Similarly, we can see what the purchasing power of $1,000 in 1970 is in 2020 like this. Why is inflation good? Inflation can be good for owners of real assets like real estate and commodities, as a rise in their prices means they can be sold for a gain later. Of course, this benefits the owner or seller at the detriment of the buyer. The aforementioned reasonable level of inflation is generally also a sign of a healthy growing economy, as it encourages more current spending and investment. This is why it's desirable to maintain that reasonable level of gradual inflation. Why is inflation bad? As opposed to assets priced in the inflated currency, inflation eats away at the value of assets denominated in the inflated currency, such as cash and nominal bonds, particularly longer-term bonds with more interest rate risk. The prospect of variable or high and rapid inflation produces uncertainty to both the economy and the stock market, which doesn't really benefit anyone. This uncertainty or variable inflation distorts asset pricing and wages at different times. Prices also tend to rise faster and earlier than wages, potentially 
potentially contributing to economic contraction and possible recession. So how can we control inflation with monetary policy? A country's monetary policy helps maintain healthy levels of inflation. In the U.S., that responsibility falls largely to the Federal Reserve Bank, or simply the Fed. Again, the Fed attempts to keep inflation within reasonable limits in order to maximize employment, stabilize prices, and encourage spending. The main levers they can pull to achieve this are influencing interest rates and the money supply. A whole video could be dedicated to this topic alone, but I'll keep it to a brief high-level summary here. Specifically, the Fed usually buys treasury bonds to inject cash into the economy, known as quantitative easing, or QE for short. The target rate of inflation in the U.S. is about 2%. QE is typically ramped up when interest rates are at or near zero, as the Fed then has fewer tools with which to act. This is somewhat of a balancing act, though, as the Fed merely hopes to influence economic activity. It cannot force lenders and borrowers to do anything. Moreover, the Fed's increase in the money supply can lead to stagflation, which is inflation without economic growth, and a devalued currency which makes imports more expensive. This itself can again drive up production costs and subsequent consumer prices, and thus inflation may accelerate beyond the Fed's target levels. Now let's look at some inflation examples. When people think of famous examples of inflation, they're almost always cases of hyperinflation, defined as an inflation rate of more than 50% per month. Hyperinflation is extremely rare in developed countries. Here are a few famous examples of hyperinflation throughout history. In Hungary in 1945 to 1946, Hungary at one point saw daily inflation of 207% after the government tried to use inflation to restore the economy after World War II. In Zimbabwe in 2007 to 2008, full-blown hyperinflation occurred at a daily rate of 98% that followed many years of high inflation, around 40% annually, as a result of reckless government spending. Zimbabwe was forced to eventually abandon its currency altogether. In Yugoslavia, in 1992 to 1994, this was a result of the dismantling of trade following the breakup of Yugoslavia. In Greece in 1944, which was a result of huge sovereign debt from World War II and tax revenues dwindling. In Germany in 1923, Hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic is one of the most famous examples in history, resulting from the government basically printing money to pay war reparations. So, inflation hedges. Do you even need them? People seem particularly concerned with inflation nowadays and how they can hedge against it. I put those words in quotes because when people discuss or fear inflation and how to hedge against it, they usually mean above average inflation. Remember, inflation per se is essentially always happening at a relatively steady rate that we hope stays around 2% per year, at least in the US. Financial pundits writing headlines about inflation fears are intrinsically referring to the prospect of inflation that is greater than or faster than the average rate. The important distinction I want to make is simply that any hedge against inflation one hopes to adopt is to mitigate the potential negative impact of unexpected above average inflation. Why is this distinction important? Recall the efficient markets hypothesis, the idea that all known information is already incorporated into the prices of assets. Many investors perhaps don't realize that this steady, constant, expected inflation we've discussed is already baked into the prices of stocks and bonds. So annual inflation continuing as it has does not necessarily hurt your portfolio, and you don't need a hedge or portfolio portfolio protection for it. Moreover, know that an extended above average inflationary environment in the U.S. is pretty rare. We haven't seen one since the 1970s, before the Volcker era, when there was a fundamental shift in U.S. monetary policy. In fairness, we are currently seeing unprecedented levels of low bond yields and high stock valuations, which could arguably contribute to a greater propensity for above average inflation. But I'd be willing to bet that it would be relatively short-lived. Incidentally, we are seeing above average inflation currently. Because of all this, arguably the best hedge for inflation is simply greater portfolio returns, usually achieved by a stocks-heavy portfolio, as stocks have the greatest expected returns of any asset class. That is, as with assets like gold, any dedicated allocation to an asset as a purported inflation hedge will likely simply drag down your long-term total return. More on this in a bit. Moreover, any allocation taken up for that purpose should probably be relatively small, as again we're talking about a pretty unlikely scenario that will likely be short-lived. Don't miss the forest for the trees. I would submit that buy and hold investors with a long time horizon and a moderate to high risk tolerance should ignore the short-term noise anyway and likely 
don't need any dedicated position as an inflation hedge, despite what the fear-mongering headlines from the pundits in the financial blogosphere say. However, as usual, retirees or those with a short time horizon or low risk tolerance may find this typical trade-off between risk and return perfectly acceptable and desirable. And that's fine and appropriate. Unexpected inflation can also be particularly damaging for these investors. The next section is for them. So now let's talk about assets and ETFs to hedge against inflation. For those who do want to specifically protect or hedge their portfolio against above average inflation, which assets are best? First, let's talk about what we're looking for and hoping to achieve with an inflation hedge. Just as one might buy put options as a direct hedge for a bullish stocks position as somewhat of a short-term insurance policy if the investor fears an impending crash in the short term, an ideal inflation hedge would increase in value to a greater degree than the CPI itself precisely when called upon, acting as an insurance policy against rapid rising inflation. Sounds great, right? Where do I sign? Unfortunately, I've got some bad news. No such asset exists. So the phrase inflation hedge is sort of a misnomer. Now you see why I said earlier that the ironic, perhaps counterintuitive answer for the best inflation hedge over the long term may just be plain old stocks and a stable job, providing the greatest returns for your portfolio leading up to and following an inflationary period, thereby allowing your portfolio's value to weather future storms more easily. In that sense, you're likely already covered. But we know that above average inflation still devalues our uninvested cash and nominal bonds in the short term, which is an important consideration for the retiree due to sequence risk. And we also know risk is experienced over the short term. So what about assets that can keep pace with or match the CPI or simply perform comparatively well during inflationary periods? Let's look at some options. First, we have real estate. Inflation means higher prices for real assets, one of which is real estate. This means higher property values. Landlords can also directly pass on inflation costs to tenants in the form of higher rents. This applies to both physical property owners and REIT investors. Though it's debatable, real estate may also offer a small diversification benefit to one's investment portfolio while not necessarily sacrificing returns. V&Q is a popular REITs ETF from Vanguard. Next on the list are commodities. Similarly, commodities are a tangible asset as well. Commodities are simply means of production, oil, gas, copper, livestock, etc. Just like with real estate, the value of these things goes up with inflation. However, I've written elsewhere how commodities are not a value producing asset, so they have a long term expected real return of about zero. Commodities funds are expensive, and there are better alternatives for inflation-protected assets, in my opinion. For those who do want exposure to broad commodities, PDBC from Invesco is the most popular broad commodities ETF and conveniently does not generate the dreadful K-1 form at tax time. While we're on the subject of commodities, the most popular one is gold. The shiny metal is often touted as an inflation hedge, but unfortunately it hasn't been a reliable one historically. Just like broad commodities, gold is also not a value producing asset, so we wouldn't expect it to generate a return over the long term. Remember what I said about an inflation protection asset likely simply dragging down the returns of the portfolio over the long term. Gold is also taxed as a collectible. I would submit that gold has no place in a long-term investment portfolio unless the investor is very risk-averse and simply wants to minimize volatility and drawdowns, as gold does tend to be uncorrelated to both stocks and bonds. For those that do want gold, SGOL is a suitable ETF that tracks the spot price of gold bullion. Now let's talk about stocks. As I've already said, stocks are a great inflation hedge simply due to their greater expected returns over the long term, not because they tend to do well during periods of high unexpected inflation. They don't. Specifically too, defensive sectors like consumer staples and utilities tend to weather inflationary and recessionary periods better than others, as public demand for these goods and services typically remains unchanged, which is why they're called non-cyclical. Value stocks in general tend to beat growth stocks during these periods as well, which is icing on the cake for investors like me who already tilt value. Once again, roads point to factor tilts. As usual, this is also a case for global diversification in stocks, as one country's inflation issues may not affect another. Vanguard's global stock market ETF is VT. Next on the list is debt. Purchasing power decreases with inflation because the value of the currency drops, but this also means that any nominal debt you have is now worth less in real terms. 
Periods of above average inflation are a great time to have a mortgage. Mortgage-backed securities, or MBS, are an option for those that don't. They're conveniently included in a total bond market ETF like Vanguard's BND. Next, we have short-term bonds. I thought you said inflation hurts nominal bonds. Yes, but not all bonds are created equal. Short-term bonds are less sensitive to interest rate changes because you can quickly roll them over into new bonds at higher yields after they mature. And a bond held to maturity should return its par value plus interest. T-bills, or ultra-short-term treasury bonds of zero to three-month maturities, even essentially kept pace with inflation during the double-digit inflation of the 1970s in the US. There have also been plenty of periods where one-month T-bills outperformed the stock market. While T-bills are quite literally the risk-free asset, they're no slouch. We would expect the returns to be slightly higher than inflation, and indeed they have been historically. The annualized historical return of three-month T-bills from 1928 through 2020 was 3.32%. The average inflation rate over that period was 3.02%, which means a real return or return adjusted for inflation of 0.3%. While we wouldn't want to hold a significant allocation in cash equivalents over the long term, they provide a decent buffer over the short term for unexpected inflation. A popular short-term treasury bond ETF with one to three year maturity from Vanguard is VGSH. Those seeking true T-bills with zero to three month maturities can use SGOV from iShares. Last on our list is tips. The only asset truly linked to inflation is a relatively new financial product called Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, or TIPS for short, which launched in the US in 1997. In short, TIPS are US Treasury bonds that are indexed to the CPI, so they rise in tandem. This is precisely what we want in an inflation protection asset. The trade-off, of course, is their limited long-term return. If inflation matches or is lower than aggregate investor expectations, TIPS will have lower returns than nominal bonds. If inflation is higher than expected, TIPS will have higher returns returns than nominal bonds. Unfortunately, TIPS did not exist in the US during the runaway inflation period of the late 70s, but one can look at the last couple years of above average inflation in 2020 and 2021 to see TIPS doing their job. Here I've compared intermediate TIPS, also referred to as real bonds, to intermediate nominal bonds of the same duration using live funds for that time period. A general rule of thumb for a retiree is to consider putting at least half of their fixed income allocation in TIPS, as high unexpected inflation can be disastrous for the retiree's portfolio, from which withdrawals are being made regularly to cover expenses and to which no new deposits are flowing. That's why I included TIPS in my design of an emergency fund replacement portfolio. It's worth noting that tips do not seem to exhibit the same crisis alpha, i.e. flight to safety behavior, that nominal treasury bonds do during stock market crashes. The retiree should also probably have a decent allocation to short or intermediate term nominal bonds. Again, I think a 50-50 split is sensible. Tips obviously become more important for retirees and those with a bond-heavy portfolio and are less attractive for younger investors with a long time horizon, but different funds exist to match the tips duration to the investing horizon. A popular ETF for short-term tips is VTIP or VTIP from Vanguard. SCHP from Schwab is a good low fee option for intermediate term and LTPZ from PIMCO for long term. I'll also toss Series I savings bonds in here since they're similar to tips. I've got a separate video on them. Inflation is always happening, hopefully at a steady rate, kept on the rails by a central bank. This expected inflation is already incorporated into asset prices. What we're concerned with possibly protecting against is unexpected above average inflation. Even then, an investor with a long time horizon and a high tolerance for risk, and subsequently a high allocation to stocks, likely shouldn't be worried about short term inflation. However, it's perfectly suitable and even desirable for retirees, risk averse investors and those with a short time horizon to have some allocation to inflation protected assets like tips. While it may go against what you've heard, commodities and gold may not be great assets to save your portfolio from runaway inflation in the future and are almost certainly suboptimal investments over the long term. I would submit that investors will likely come out ahead using assets like REITs, short term nominal bonds, and tips. I'm not a fan of sector bets because they're just stock picking light, but it may also be prudent to slightly overweight defensive sectors like consumer staples and utilities if one fears inflation, or any market turmoil for that matter. How do you approach inflation in your portfolio? 
let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Some of the links below are referral links at no additional cost to you. If you choose to make a purchase or sign up for a service, after clicking through those links, I may receive a small commission. This allows me to continue producing high quality content on this channel and pays for the occasional cup of coffee. I have firsthand experience with every product or service I recommend, and I recommend them because I genuinely believe they are useful.